The Commonwealth vs. Lizzie Borden A Dramatic Reading of the Full Trial Transcript Day 3 Day 3, Wednesday, June 7, 1893 New Bedford, Massachusetts Chief Justice Mason and Justices Blodgett and Dewey presided. The state was represented by Honorable Hosea M. Knowlton, District Attorney for the Southern District, and William H. Moody, Esquire, District Attorney for the Eastern District. The defendant, Miss Borden, was represented by Honorable George D. Robinson, Honorable Andrew J. Jennings, and Melvin O. Adams, Esquire. The prosecution calls its next witness, Abraham G. Hart. Mr. Hart is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. Abraham G. Hart is your name? Yes, sir. You live in Fall River? I do, sir. Are you the treasurer of some bank? I am, of the Union Savings Bank. Were you acquainted with Andrew J. Borden in his life? I was for 40 years or more. Where is your bank situated? In what is sometimes called Market Square, uh, North Main Street, a few rods from the City Hall. On which side of North Main Street? Upon the east side. Is it just north of City Hall? It is. Did Mr. Borden have any relation to that bank? He was president of the bank for four or five years before he died. Do you recall the day of these homicides? I do. Did you see Mr. Borden at any time during that day? I did. When and where did you see him? He came into the bank, as was his usual custom in the morning, about half past nine. It wouldn't vary but a few minutes from that time, I think. Do you have any recollection of looking at any timepiece? I don't think I did. Did you have any talk with him? I did. Can you tell me how long he remained there? Or about how long he remained there? He remained there about five minutes, no more than seven. Was anyone with him? There was not. There were others present, but not with him. Did you notice where he went after he left your bank? I did not. Except that he turned to the right, as I remember. Is there any other banks in the building in which your bank is? There is the National Union Bank, a separate organization from the Savings Bank. It is agreed, if your honors please, to save calling a number of witnesses. I will state what we agreed to. Uh, For the purposes of this trial, your honors, it is agreed that the defendant, uh, having no knowledge in regard to a will or otherwise, so far as is now ascertained, the deceased was uh, intestate. Also, without any further inquiries, that the amount of property in the name of Andrew J. Borden at the time of his death may be taken to be from $250,000 to $300,000. That is agreeable to us. That saves calling a number of witnesses. Mr. Moody completes the direct examination of the witness. Cross-examination of the witness by George Robinson of the defense. It was a usual thing for Mr. Borden to come about that time? Yes, sir. There was nothing unusual in his coming at that time? No, sir. You think it was half past nine and that he ought to come at half past nine as he usually did? Generally, he came at that time, but sometimes he would defer it until later when he was going over the river to the farm, between 11 and 12 o'clock. That would make it a good deal later? Yes, sir. As you recall it, you have not much doubt he was there sometime between 9.30 and 9.35? It would swing either way? I don't think it would swing either way, five minutes from half past nine. Well, you say when he went out of your door, he turned to the right? Yes, sir. Which would lead him along further on the main street? Uh, Yes, sir. Uh, I I would not be positive that he turned to the right. That is my impression. But I would not say so under oath. That is the impression I got. Uh, But if a person were intending to go from your bank to the First National Bank, he would go to the right? Yes, sir. And your bank is somewhere between City Hall and the Wilbur House? Yes, sir. To your sight that morning, did Mr. Borden seem in the usual health? I think he was under the weather, as we say. He did not look as well as usual? No, sir. Mr. Robinson completes the cross-examination of the witness. Prosecution witness Abraham G. Hart is excused. The prosecution calls its next witness, John T. Burrell. Mr. Burrell is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. What is your name? John T. Burrell. You live in Fall River? I do. And what is your occupation? 
cashier of the National Union Bank. In what building is that situated? In the same building as the Union Savings Bank, number three, Market Square. In the same building as the bank of which Mr. Hart is cashier? In the same room. Do you remember the date of these homicides, August 4th, 1892? I do. Did Mr. Borden have any connection with your bank? He was a stockholder and depositor. Did you see him on the morning of August 4th, 1892? I did. Where did you see him? In the bank in front of the counter where I was at work. Did you see him in conversation or standing with anyone? I saw him standing in conversation with Mr. Hart and a colored man who was there in regard to a loan. Uh, That is, uh, Abraham G. Hart, the last witness? Yes, sir. Have you any means of fixing the time or about the time that you saw Mr. Borden there? Not accurately, but I think I can tell somewhere near. Very well, do so. I think it must have been between quarter past nine and quarter to ten. Do you recall how long or about how long he remained in that building? I should say possibly ten or fifteen minutes. Did you notice where he went when he turned and went out of the building? I did not. Is your bank in the rear or front part of the room? The front. Mr. Hart's bank is in the rear of yours? Yes, sir. There is a single counter, a continuous counter, I suppose? It runs the length of the building. And a counter only on one side of the room? That is all. Mr. Moody completes the direct examination of the witness. Cross-examination of the witness by George Robinson of the defense. Uh, Do I get it right that you say that he came there somewhere between quarter past nine and a quarter of ten? Yes, sir. That is, you fix these times as the times when he might have come in there somewhere between those two times? Yes, sir. And you say whenever he did come in that morning, he stayed 10 or 15 minutes? According to the best of my recollection. So that if he came in at a quarter of 10 or thereabouts, uh, he would not leave until what time? That would make it between that and 11 o'clock. My impression is that it was between quarter past nine and quarter before ten. Now, does that time, to your recollection, include the time he was in there so that you would get him out, if I may be permitted to say so, uh, before ten o'clock? Yes, sir. Mr. Robinson completes the cross-examination of the witness. Prosecution witness John T. Burrell is excused. The prosecution calls its next witness Everett M. Cook. Mr. Cook is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. Your full name is Everett Cook. Everett M. Cook. Yes, sir. You live in Fall River, sir? Yes, sir. Your occupation is what? Cashier of the First National Bank of Fall River. And you held that position, did you, on August 4th, 1892? I did, sir. Where is your bank situated? On North Main Street. How, with reference to the City Hall and the Union Savings Bank? Is it nearer City Hall or more distant from City Hall than the Union Savings Bank? More distant. That is, it is between the Union Savings Bank and the Mellon House? Yes, sir. It is on the same side of the street as the Union Savings Bank? No, sir. The other side? Yes, sir. Is there any other banking institution in the same building with yours? Yes, sir. And what is that? The BMC Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Company. Had Mr. Borden any relation to your bank? To the trust company. He was a director. The trust company is in the same building? Is it in the same room? Yes, sir. In the same room as well as in the same building? Behind the same counter. I don't know that I quite caught what his relation was to the trust company. He was a director. Did you see him on the morning of August 4th, 1892, the day of his death? I did, sir. And where did you see him? At the bank. Did you see him transact any business there? Yes, sir. With whom? With me. How long did he remain in the bank? About ten minutes. What time did he come in? About quarter of ten. And left ten minutes later? Yes, sir. Did you have occasion to consult any timepiece with reference to the time? There was a clock, and I should say about that time I had the right of way on the counter that morning. And I glanced at the clock, and I should fix the time about quarter of ten. Did you notice in which direction he went as he left your bank? I did not. You told us how long he stayed with you? Yes, sir. And what was it? About ten minutes. Mr. Moody completes the direct examination of the witness. Cross-examination of the witness by George Robinson of the defense. His stop was about ten minutes? Yes, sir. To the best of your recollection. And he went out about five minutes of ten? Yes, sir. Do you know the defendant, Miss Lizzie Borden? Yes, sir. At any time, has she had an account in your bank as depositor? 
I think not as a personal account. Do you know anything about the deposits in the BMC Durfee Trust Company? Yes, sir. Do you know whether or not she had a deposit there? I think not, sir. You do not recall it? No, sir. And at that time, do you know positively without looking? No, sir. Mr. Robinson completes the cross-examination of the witness. Prosecution witness Everett M. Cook is excused. The prosecution calls its next witness, Jonathan Clegg. Mr. Clegg is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. What is your full name, sir? Jonathan Clegg. Are you somewhat hard of hearing, Mr. Clegg? Yes, sir. What is your business? Hatter and Gents Furnishings. Do you live in Fall River? Yes, sir. How long have you lived in Fall River? 22 years. Did you know Andrew Borden in his lifetime? Yes, sir. How long had you known him? Oh, perhaps 15 years. Do you recall the day of his death, August 4th, 1892? Yes. Upon that day, did you see him anywhere? Yes. On August 4th, 1892, where was your place of business? Number 6, North Main Street. Now, where is that place of business with reference to the Union Savings Bank? Well, it might have been 50 yards, the opposite side of the street. It is the shop that is now occupied as a fruit store. Yes, sir. Where did you first see Mr. Borden on the morning of August 4th? In my store, 6 North Main Street. Did you see him before he came into the store? I called him into the store. I wished to see him that morning. Where was he when you called him into the store? The opposite side of the street. I was wanting to see him specially that morning. Did you have some talk with him in your store? Yes, sir. About how long did he remain in the store? Well, perhaps about eight or nine minutes. Was anyone with him at the time? No, sir. Did you notice where he went, in which direction he went when he went out of the store? Yes, sir. He went south. Is that toward City Hall? Yes, sir. Uh, you occupy another store at the present time? Yes, sir. Did he go in the direction of that store that you now occupy? Yes, sir. Now, will you tell me what time it was when Mr. Borden left your shop? Exactly 29 minutes past 10. By what means do you fix the time? The City Hall clock. Did you have some occasion, and I don't ask what it is, to fix the time that Mr. Borden left you? Well, the reason why I fixed no, it I exactly... No, I didn't ask you what the reason was, but did you have some reason? Yes, sir. Did you look at the clock before he left you, or after he left you, or as he left you? Just as he left me, I looked at the City Hall clock. Did you ever see him again alive? No, sir. At that time, Mr. Clegg, were you having some dealings with him with reference to hiring another store? I had already hired it. It was to make arrangements. And that store is where? 92 South Main Street. How far from the corner of Spring Street? How far from the present one? The store that you had then hired from him. Well, I should say it is 300 yards. From the corner of Spring Street. Oh, my present store from the corner of Spring Street. Yes. Oh, three stores, I think. Near the corner? Yes. Had you gone to Mr. Borden's house to visit him with reference to this store? Yes, sir. When and how many times did you go there? Twice. Do you remember what days you went there? Yes, Tuesday, the first day. Tuesday of the same week? Tuesday on the second. Uh, Tuesday, the second of August, 1892. What day did you next go there? Wednesday. The following day? Yes, sir. So that you were there the two days preceding the homicide? Yes, sir. Who let you in either of those times? The servant Bridget, as I afterwards learned. Uh, both times? No, I think he let me in the first time. Bridget let me in the second time. How long did you remain in the house with him? Well, about ten minutes. Did you go in the front door or rear door? Front door. What was the subject of your conversation? Hiring the store. Mr. Moody completes the direct examination of the witness. Cross-examination of the witness by George Robinson of the defense. Let me see if we understand it right. Uh, were you in a store that is nearer the city hall than the one where you are now? Yes, sir. And you wanted to meet him at the store where you now are that morning? What is that? Did you want to see him at number 92 Main Street that morning? Yes, sir. And did you see him there? I saw him in 6 North Main Street, but I didn't see him at 92. It was when he left number 6 North Main Street that you looked at the clock? Yes, sir. I want to know how far that number 6 North Main Street is distant from City Hall. 
Well, in the mind's eye, I should say from City Hall to my door, it might be 80 yards. That's the old store? Yes, sir. And then about how far is it from the old store to the new store? Well, I should say 250 yards, perhaps. Was the old store north or south of the City Hall? North. The old store is north of the City Hall. And the new store, where was that? South. So that in going, he had to pass the City Hall to go from the old store to... To the new. Yes, sir. And the new store is only three stores away from the corner of Spring Street. Yes, sir. And Spring Street leads off of Main Street up into Second Street. Yes, sir. You are very clear in your mind that he went out of number six North Main Street at 10 o'clock and 29 minutes? Yes, sir. That is the last time you saw him alive? Yes, sir. Mr. Robinson completes the cross-examination of the witness. Prosecution witness Jonathan Clegg is excused. The prosecution calls its next witness, Joseph Shortsleeves. Mr. Shortsleeves is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. Is your name Joseph Shortsleeves? Yes, sir. Where do you reside, Mr. Shortsleeves? I live in number 8 Dover Street. In Fall River? Yes, Fall River. How long have you lived in Fall River? About 16 years. What is your present occupation? Carpenter by trade. Have you always been a carpenter? Well, ever since I left the factories, and that is 22 years ago. Did you know Andrew Borden when he was alive? Yes, sir. How long had you known Mr. Borden? Oh, in the neighborhood of 10 years. Had you done some work for him? Yes, sir. On the 4th of August, 1892, were you at work upon the store that is now occupied by Mr. Clegg? Yes, sir. The store that is on what street? On Main Street, sir. And near the corner of Spring Street? Third house from Spring Street towards the City Hall. It was South Main Street that you were? South Main Street, yes, sir. What were you doing about the store on August 4th? We were making changes in the front windows. We were lowering them down. It was Mr. Borden's property, as you understand it? Yes, sir. And, as you understand it, one that was let to Mr. Clegg? Mr. Clegg, yes, sir. And one that Mr. Clegg now occupies? Occupies at the present time, yes, sir. Did you see Mr. Borden on the morning of August 4th? Yes, sir. Where did you see him? I saw him coming up South Main Street from the City Hall towards where we were working. And would that be coming also from the direction of the shop that Mr. Clegg then occupied? Occupied at the present time. At that time? No. You say he was coming towards your place. Towards where we were working. From City Hall? From City Hall. And that would also be coming from the shop that Mr. Clegg then occupied? Yes, sir. When he came to your shop, what did he do? He came into the front door, went to the back part of the store, picked up a lock that had been on the front store door. It was all broken to pieces. He looked at it, laid it down again, went upstairs then went from the back part of the shop up to the front part of the shop, upstairs over our heads. Was there a few moments and came down again, picked the lock up and walked out. In the course of all this, did you exchange any words with him? No, sir. Not at that time. Can you tell me about what time it was that he was there? As near as I can remember, it was between half past ten, quarter eleven. Did you have any occasion to observe any timepiece at that time? Well, no, not in particular only. Of course, I had my watch in my pocket and I had the city hall to look at. I only ask you if you had any occasion to look at a timepiece. No, sir. You didn't? No, sir. Your testimony as to the time is an estimate, then? Yes, sir. When he left, did you notice in which direction he was going? Yes, sir. In which direction did he disappear? He went towards the west, across the road, part ways across South Main Street. Towards the other side of South Main Street? Yes, sir. Did you notice where he went then? He came back again, turned around and looked at us. Says I, good morning, Mr. Borden, and he says, good morning to you. What did he do then? Uh, he stepped into the store and said... I don't care what he said. Oh, he said something to you, did he? Yes, sir. Then what did he do? After he had spoken to us, he turned around and went up Main Street as far as Spring. Then he got out of our sight then. In which direction did he turn when he passed out of sight on Main Street? He turned to his left. I may not have understood you, Mr. Shortsleeves. Did I understand you that he came into the store twice? No, sir. He did not first come in and then start out across the street and come back again? He came as far as the window where we were at work on the sidewalk. Was anyone at work with you on that day, Mr. Shortsleeves? Yes, sir. Uh, who was it? M Mr. Mather, James Mather. Did you notice whether he looked at any clock at the time? I, I do not ask what he told you, but did you notice him? Well, I noticed he stepped out onto the sidewalk and looked down the street. I could not say if he looked at the town clock or not. From the sidewalk in front of this store, is the town clock in sight? Yes, sir, plain. 
When he did step out and look down in the direction of City Hall, was it just as Mr. Borden left, before he left, or after he left? No, he was on the way coming up. Mr. Moody completes the direct examination of the witness. Cross-examination of the witness by George Robinson of the defense. You were at work at number 92 South Main Street? Yes, sir. And James Mather was working with you? I didn't understand the first word. Please tell me again. As I understand it, I want to get it right. Uh, The first you noticed of him, he came along in front of the store where you were working? No, sir. Well, tell me correctly, because if I'm wrong, I want to be set right. I should think he was about 75 feet from where we were at work. I see him coming up Main Street. And did he come right along up in front of the store? Yes, sir. He came right along up. And then, do I get it right that he went over across the street to the other side? No, sir. Did you not say something about his coming across the street? He came into the store first. He went into the building first. He came along up towards the store the first time, or the only time perhaps. It was when your companion looked at the clock? Yes, sir. As he was coming up, approaching the store? Yes, sir. After I told him Mr. Borden was... Now, I don't want to know what you told him. Leave that out. Then Mr. Borden came in the store, did he? Yes, sir. And went in around in the lower part? He went right straight through the lower part. Didn't go around it. He went through to the back stairs. And went upstairs? Yes, sir. And then how long do you think he was gone upstairs? Well, I should judge in the neighborhood of two minutes. He came down pretty nearly directly? Yes, sir. And then did he go partly across the street or over the street? Partly across the street, sir. He did not go clear across. And then changed back again and came over onto the same sidewalk? He turned around, looked at the building, came over to us. I said, good morning, Mr. Borden. Good morning, he said. Didn't he say good morning when he came into the store? No, sir. He had not met you then? He had not noticed us. So that he went into the store and came upstairs? Yes, sir. And uh, came down again and started to go across the street, and before getting across, he turned back and then came up to you and said good morning? Yes, sir. Now, I do not ask what the conversation was, but did he talk more with you than that? Yes, sir. And about how long did he stay there before he started towards home? I should think probably three or four minutes. So that from the time that you saw him coming, about 75 feet away from the store, he came up to the front of the store, went in, and was some two or three minutes upstairs and down before he passed out onto the sidewalk again. Is that right? That is about as near as I can come to it. And then he started to go across the street and did not get quite over. No, sir. He started to come back, exchanged good mornings with you and your friend both, and stopped and talked with you three or four minutes? Somewhere's about that. He did not go back into the store again? No, sir. Which way did he go? Turned around and went on South Main Street as far as Spring Street. Did you see him go around the corner? I could not say. I looked back a few minutes afterwards and he was out of my sight. You did not see him go around Spring Street? No, sir, not around Spring Street. Mr. Robinson completes the cross-examination of the witness. Redirect examination of the witness by Mr. Moody of the prosecution. You said that Mr. Mather looked at the clock after you had told him something. Did he look at the clock before or after you said good morning to Mr. Borden? He looked down the street. I don't know whether he looked at the clock before I said good morning to Mr. Borden. You cannot tell whether he looked at the clock or not. No, I could not exactly say as he did. I think you said before that as Mr. Borden was coming up the sidewalk and coming to the store, you saw him about 75 feet away? From where we were working. And then he came in, went up the stairs, came down and went partly across the street. Yes, sir. And came back, and when he was coming across the street, your friend looked down at the clock. I did not say it that way. Well, tell me how it was. I said I saw Mr. Borden coming up towards where we were working, about 75 feet from where we were. And what was done? I told him Mr. Borden was coming, then he stepped out on the sidewalk. I don't know whether to see the clock or Mr. Borden, but he was coming up anyway. So finally, he stepped into the store again. He was coming up, and from some conversation you had with your companion, your companion stepped out on the sidewalk and looked down the street towards the clock, we will say? Toward Mr. Borden. I told him Mr. Borden was coming up. I don't know which way he looked to. That is when he came right up to the front of your store when you were at work. That was when he was coming up. Before he went into the store. Yes, sir. So that after your companion looked at the clock, Mr. Borden, or down the street, after he looked down the street towards City Hall... Mr. Borden went into your store, came down, started to go across the street, 
and came back and talked with you three or four minutes and then walked towards home. Yes, sir. Mr. Moody completes the redirect examination of the witness. Prosecution witness Joseph Shortsleeves is excused. The prosecution calls its next witness, James Mather. Mr. Mather is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. Your name is James Mather, isn't it? Yes, sir. And you live in Fall River? Yes, sir. How long have you lived in Fall River? Four years. What is your business, Mr. Mather? Carpenter. Did you know Mr. Borden in his lifetime? No, sir. And never saw him up to at least August 4th? No, sir. On the fourth day of August, 1892, where were you working? I was working up in Jonathan Clegg's store, fixing it for him. Do you mean the store that he occupies at the present time? No, sir. The one that he was going to occupy. The one he was going to occupy on August 4th. Is it the store near the corner of Spring Street? Yes, sir. On South Main Street? Yes, sir. Who was working with you about the store that morning? Mr. Shortsleeves. The last witness who came in here? Yes, sir. What were you doing about the store? We are going to drop the front windows down lower, near the sidewalk. We were working on that. Where were you working? On the outside. You were working all the time on the outside? Pretty near. Well, asking as to the time between 10 and 11, were you on the outside? Yes, sir. All the time? When you were on the outside, was the city hall clock in your view or not? It was in my view. Uh, do you recall on that morning a person coming there that was told to you to be Mr. Borden? Mr. Shortsleeves is the one that told me it was Mr. Borden. Well, let me go ahead a little. Did you hear any conversation between this person who came and Mr. Shortsleeves? Mr. Borden, you mean? Oh, uh, well, yes, Mr. Borden. Yes, sir. And any greeting, any morning greeting was there? Did you hear that? Yes, sir. Now, by what name was that man addressed, and how did he reply? Mr. Shortsleeves said, Good morning, Mr. Borden. Uh, there is no question it was Mr. Borden, if that is what you want. Well, then, we will call that man Mr. Borden. When Mr. Borden came to the store, did he go in? Yes, sir. Did you see him on his way to the store, or didn't you see him until he got there? I didn't see him until he got there. What did he do after he got there? He went straight in the store and went upstairs. What did he do after he went upstairs? I don't know. Did you see him come down again? Yes, sir. What did he do after he came down again? He walked up. Did you notice where he went? He went partly across the street. What did he do then? He stopped and looked round again and came straight back to the store. Did he go inside? It? No, sir. He stood at the door where we were working, or the window, rather. Did he do anything or have any conversation with anyone? He spoke to Mr. Shortsleeves that time. Then what did he do? He went then inside and picked up a lock, and then went out again. Did you notice where he went? He turned in the direction of Spring Street. You were on the outside so you could see? Yes, sir. Now, can you tell me what time it was when Mr. Borden went away from that store? About... 20 minutes of 11. Did you consult any timepiece at or about the time he went away? I looked at the city hall clock. Did you notice where Mr. Borden went when he got to the corner of Spring Street? I didn't see him get that far. Did he come back to the store again, or did you see him again at all? No, sir. The last you saw of him, he was between this store and the corner of Spring Street. Yes, sir. Going towards Spring Street. Yes, sir. Mr. Moody completes the direct examination of the witness. Cross-examination of the witness by George Robinson of the defense. Were you lowering the windows in the front of the block? Yes, sir. And you were working on the outside of the window, and Mr. Shortsleeves was working on the inside? Yes, sir. Uh, was there a front in the building at that time? The sash was taken out. I mean, was the front wall of the building there, and you had cut out the place for getting the windows in? Oh, no. It was old sash we took out and dropped near to the sidewalk. It was high up. Whether it was a new building? No, sir. An old building being altered? Yes, sir. And so that the front wall of the building was there? Yes, sir. Now, were there two windows in the front of the store that you were lowering? Yes, sir. And which window, as you stood facing the store in the front, which window were you working on at that time? The one nearest the north side, nearest the city hall. Um, on the left-hand side of the door, as you would facing the building? Yes, sir. And Mr. Shortsleeves was working on the inside and you on the outside? Yes, sir. Did you see him uh, coming up the street before he reached the store? No, sir. The first thing you knew, did he say good morning or uh, you to him? Mr. Shortsleeves spoke good morning to him. Then he went right in. This is the first I see him. I didn't know him then. What is that? That is the first time I had seen him. Did you say you didn't know him? Not until after he returned. When did you look at the clock? 20 minutes to 11. Uh, I know, but I mean when with reference to Mr. Borden. Uh, where was he when you looked at the clock? 
I couldn't say whether it was the time he left or the time he came there. It was about that time. Then it might have been that he got there 20 minutes of 11. It might have been. Well, to the best of your recollection, that was so, wasn't it? Yes, sir. To the best of your recollection, 10.40, 20 minutes before 11, was when he came up. Not when he came up, but while he was around there. That is what I meant. Now, what was he doing when you looked at the clock? I couldn't see what he was doing at the time. I looked at the clock. I couldn't say that. When you looked at the clock, it was just 20 minutes of 11? Well, it might have been 19 or 21, but it was neither more nor less. Something like that. Yes, sir. Can you tell me whether he went upstairs after you looked at the clock or before? I couldn't say. And he was there some three or four minutes upstairs and around? About that time. And then he came down. Did he stop to talk to you again? No, sir. He came down and went out. In the first place, he started to go across the street, didn't he? Yes, sir. And then stopped and looked at the building? Yes, sir. And then came back? Yes, sir. And then he stopped and talked with you there some? Talked to Mr. Shortsleeves. And you were present? Yes, sir. And then how long did he stay there talking at that time? About a minute or so. Now, you are not able to say positively the time any nearer than that, somewhere from 19 to 21 minutes of 11. No, sir, not Positively. And you cannot positively say where Mr. Borden was when you looked at the clock? No, sir. And you cannot positively say how long after you looked at the clock he was there or about the premises? No, sir. It was it something like, take it all together, after you looked at the clock some five minutes or so? I couldn't say. To the best of your recollection, can you say? To the best of my recollection, I couldn't say. You wouldn't be able to tell us then positively that he did not leave there till... Quarter of eleven, would you, positively? Well, I don't think he stayed that time, but I wouldn't be positive. And then he walked along up the hill? Walked up towards Spring Street. It is rising ground, isn't it? No, about level. Spring Street is rising ground up to Second Street. Well, he was an elderly man? Yes, sir. And it was a very warm morning, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And of course, he didn't hurry much? I couldn't say. And you didn't notice how fast he walked? I didn't notice. Although the jury have seen these various spots, I think it might add clearness if I pointed them out to them. Mr. Moody indicates the locations on the plan to the jury. Mr. Robinson completes the cross-examination of the witness. Prosecution witness James Mather is excused. The prosecution calls its next witness Bridget Sullivan. Miss Sullivan is sworn in and takes the witness stand. Direct examination of the witness by William H. Moody of the prosecution. What is your full name? Bridget Sullivan. And were you in the Borden household, sometimes called Maggie? Yes, sir. By whom were you called Maggie? By the whole family? No, sir. By whom? By Lizzie and Emma. By Miss Emma and Miss Lizzie? Yes, sir. Won't you be kind enough to tell us how old you are, Miss Sullivan? Twenty-six years old. I believe you have never been married? No, sir. How long have you been in this country? Six years last May. Seven years last May. And where were you born? In Ireland. And came here seven years ago? Yes, sir. Came to what part of the country? I came to Newport. Newport, Rhode Island? Yes, sir. Did you have any folks when you came here? No, sir. Father, mother, brother, sisters? No, sir. And have you any here now? No, sir. I ain't got no folks here. No more than relations. When you went to Newport, did you stay there quite a while? Twelve months. And from Newport, where did you go? I went out to South Bethlehem. That was in Pennsylvania? Yes, sir. When did you come to Fall River? I came there four years. I was two years out when I came to Fall River. Two years in America when I came to Fall River. Did you go to the Bordens, the first place in Fall River? No, sir. I went to Mrs. Reed. When did you go to work for Mr. Borden? I was there two years and nine months. At the time of his death? Yes, sir. Were there any other domestic servants in the family except yourself? No, sir. Not while I was there. Or was there any man who worked there while you were there, taking care of a horse or anything of that sort? No, sir. There was a man on the farm who used to come there and do chores and then go back again. He came from the farm? Yes, sir. What was his name? His first name was Alfred. I don't know his last name. I never asked him. While I'm upon that subject, I will ask you about the barn. While you were there, was it used for anything at all? They had a horse while I was there. And when did they cease to have any horse there? I guess it was about a year before that, as far as I can remember. You mean before the homicides? Yes, sir. Before the death of Mr. Borden? Yes, sir. After the horse had been discontinued, did they use the barn for anything? No, sir, I don't think they did. There was some hay in the barn. 
was that hay that had been left over from the time that the horse had been kept there. I suppose so. I don't know. Did you know of any hay being put in after the horse had been sold or disposed of? No, sir. I don't remember. Perhaps you can tell us while we're on the barn how that front door runs. Does it go on wheels? Is it a sliding door, or is it a door that opens? It opens. Works on hinges? Yes, sir. Uh, That is the front door of the barn facing the street, I mean. The front door facing the street goes on hinges, I think. The carriage door, I mean, that faces the street. Mr. Moody shows the photograph of the exterior of the Borden house. You can see it there. I don't know. I never have been in that door, I think. Have you ever seen that door open? Yes, sir. I don't know, but I saw it open. Do you know whether it was kept locked or not? I don't know anything about it. Had you seen it open recently, before the death of Mr. Borden? Or do you mean that you saw it open when they had a horse and carriage? Saw it open a while before the death of the Bordens. Well, some man was looking at some carriages there, I guess. How long was that before their death? I can't remember. Some days or weeks? Some weeks. Had you seen it since that time? No, sir. I don't remember. What were your general duties in the household, Miss Bridget? Washing, ironing and cooking, with sweeping. Did you have any care of the chambers? No, sir. Except your own, I suppose. That is all. You slept in the third story of the house? Yes, sir. Can you tell us the position of the room that you slept in? Well, it was right over the Borden's room. And Mr. Borden's room is right over the kitchen? Yes, sir. Who did the chamber work in Mr. Borden's room and Mrs. Borden's? I don't know. Themselves did it. I don't know which of them. That is, you didn't do it. No, sir. Did either of the daughters do it? No, sir. Perhaps this will aid us in fixing the room. In in what way does your window look? It looks out on the backyard. Directly into the rear of the house? Yes, sir. Mr. Moody shows the photograph of the exterior of the Borden house. Will you look at that photograph and see if you can point out the windows in your room? Take time enough so that you'll understand it. I don't know. If that ain't it, I can't explain it. If it confuses you, quite likely it may. I I won't refer to it. Is it one of those windows in the third story? Yes, sir. Two rooms. The room next to it had one window in it. And two windows. Leads out into the backyard. Do you know whether your room is the room next to Mrs. Churchill's house or next to Mrs. Kelly's house? Next to Mrs. Kelly's house. Uh, Who occupied the other room, if anyone? Uh, Did anyone? No, sir. Except when the hired man slept there. Sometimes Mr. Marsh slept there. Do you know who took charge of the room in the front part of the house? Well, when Miss Emma was home, she done it. When Mr. Marsh was there, and when Mrs. Borden had any of her friends there, I guess she done it or helped to do it. That is, as far as I can remember. That is the front chamber you're talking about? Yes, sir. Now, do you know who took care of the rooms belonging to the daughters, or occupied by the daughters? Themselves took care of them, as far as I know. And did that care include sweeping and dusting as well as making the beds? Yes, sir. I didn't have anything to do with the rooms. You had nothing of any kind to do with the bedrooms? No, sir. Had you known Mr. Morse before the time of Mr. Borden's death? Yes, sir. How long had you known him? I can't remember how long. Quite a while. He had occasionally come to the house, had he? Yes, sir. And stayed overnight? Yes, sir. Can you tell who took charge of the parlor, sweeping, dusting, and cleaning of it? Miss Lizzie, in the summer. Did you have anything to do with it? No, sir. Do you remember Mr. Morse coming to the house on the Wednesday, the day before the death? Yes, sir. Did you see him? Yes, sir. When did you see him on the Wednesday? Well, I could not exactly tell whether it was two o'clock, or after two, or before two, but after dinner. Where did he come from, or, or what door? Came in the back door. Who let him in? I don't know. I can't remember who let him in. I think Mrs. Borden. I cannot tell. But I saw the man coming in. Did you get any dinner for him? No, sir. Do you know whether any dinner was got for him? Mrs. Borden did. Did you clean up the dishes after dinner, or Mrs. Borden? Mrs. Borden put the dishes out in the kitchen from the dining room. You washed them? Yes, sir. Did you go out that afternoon? No, sir. Where did you remain on the afternoon of Wednesday after Mr. Morse came? Because I was ironing until four or half past four in the kitchen. Uh, What day had you done your washing that week? Monday. What day had you done the drying of your clothes? Monday, if it was pleasant. 
Oh, I mean this particular week. Monday was the regular washing day. Did you wash on Monday, the week of Mr. Borden's death? Yes, sir. Did you dry your clothes on Monday? No, sir. On what day did you dry your clothes? Tuesday. Where did you do your washing? Down cellar. In that part of the cellar known as the washroom? Yes, sir. Is there any other faucet downstairs except the faucet in the sink of the washroom? No, sir. Not that you know of. When you did your washing on that week... How was the door leading out into the backyard from the cellar? Open or closed? It was open while I was down there. How was it on the day on which you did your drying? Tuesday. Was the door open or closed? It was closed. Who had locked that door after you got through washing and taking in your clothes? I locked the door as I hung out the last of my clothes all the time. How did you lock the door? A bolt. A bolt on which side of the door? The inside. Now from that time, which was Tuesday... Uh, Was it Tuesday you locked it, or Monday? Tuesday. From that time, did you have any occasion to go down into the cellar and washroom from time to time? I went down, but not through that door. I mean down from inside of the house. Yes, sir. Did you notice any change in that door, down to and after the time of the death of Mr. and Mrs. Borden? No, sir. So far as you know, it had remained bolted. As far as I know, I didn't see any change in it. Before going again to Wednesday, I will ask you to describe the character of the travel on 2nd Street as far as you can. Were there few people or many people who passed up and down that street? On Wednesday? Uh, No, I mean generally. I could not say. There was traffic, more or less. Folks, carriages, and teams. Did you go to your room at all on the Wednesday afternoon after you finished your ironing? Yes, sir. About what time did you go up to the room then? I should say quarter to five or half past four. I cannot tell. What time did you come down again? About half past five, as far as I can remember. I cannot exactly tell. Do you remember how you left the screen door when you went up? Yes, sir. How was it? The screen door was hooked. The hook was inside, I believe. Yes, sir. Did you get supper on the Wednesday night? Yes, sir. Passing back a moment, did you notice anything, and don't tell me what anyone said, about Mr. Borden and Mrs. Borden's condition of health on Wednesday morning? Yes, sir. What did it appear to be? Sec. Did you go out on Wednesday night? Yes, sir. Had you been there through Wednesday? Yes, sir. Were you sick at all that week before Thursday morning? No, sir. I don't remember that it was. What was your condition on Tuesday night, the night preceding your description of Mr. and Mrs. Borden? I was feeling pretty well in the morning. I got up with a headache. Oh, which morning? Thursday morning. Oh, I'm speaking of Tuesday night. You passed a good night, did you? Yes, sir. Did you have any occasion after the dinner hour on Wednesday to go into the front part of the house? No, sir. To do any work of any kind? No, sir. I went to the front door on Wednesday. What was the occasion of going to the front door on Wednesday? I let Dr. Bowen in. Was that in the morning or the afternoon? It was in the morning. Did you go to that door again on Wednesday after you let Dr. Bowen in? No, sir. How was the door when you let Dr. Bowen in on Wednesday? The spring lock had the key in it. Sprung locked, was it? Yes. Did you say you had no occasion to go to that door again on that day? No, sir. I was about to ask you where you passed Wednesday evening. I was up in my friend's in 3rd Street. Was it far from the house? No, sir, not far. What time did you go, and what time did you return on Wednesday evening? I guess I got out about 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and went down 2nd Street. Called for a friend of mine on 3rd Street. We went down Main Street and up Morgan Street and turned up 3rd Street. To my friends on 3rd Street. If you could tell me about what time you got home, I would like to have you. I think it was about five minutes past ten. When you got home, was there any light in the house? The lamp was in the kitchen. The lamp waiting you? Yes, sir. Did you light it? No, sir. It was lighted. It was always left lighted when I was out. Was there any light in the sitting room, the dining room, or either of the chambers that you saw? No, sir. I did not see any light in any part of the house. When you went out on Wednesday evening, how did you leave the back door? Sprung locked. The wooden door. Was that shut? Yes, sir. Did you have a key? Yes, sir. When you came back, how did you find the door? It was locked. Are you unlocked, did I take it? Yes, sir. With your key? Yes, sir. Did anyone else have a key to the back door? I think Mrs. Borden had a key to it. After you passed in through that door, did you notice anything as to how it was locked, whether locked or otherwise? I locked it myself, with three locks as I came in. How did you lock it after you came in? There was a lock, a spring lock, a bolt and a spring. There were two spring locks and a bolt. In what condition were all those locks left on the Wednesday night when you last came in? Well, I hocked the screen door. I came in and locked the wooden door and sprung the latch. 
and a catch which couldn't be opened from the outside with any key, and then bolted the other lock. And you say you hooked the screen in addition? Yes, sir. Did you go directly to bed? Yes, sir. I went and took the lamp off the table, and went to the ice chest, and took a glass of milk, that was all. Just before you went to bed? Yes, sir. That was all I did. I went upstairs. What milk was that you took? Well, I guess it was the milk we had that day. The Wednesday's milk? Yes, sir. Did you use milk every day? Yes, sir. From time to time. What time in the morning did the milkman come, if he came in the morning? Couldn't tell. The milk was always left. I guess, probably five or half past five. I can't tell. Before you got up? Yes, sir. And how was it left? Left in the can outside the door. The night before, what did you do about the can? I put the can out the night before. On the doorstep. That is, you washed the can yourself? Yes, sir. And put it out? Yes, sir. And then in the morning, was that same can filled? No, sir. The can was taken and there was another can left. There was an exchange each morning? Yes, sir. You had two cans? Yes, sir. One of which was with the milkman all the time and the other at home? Yes, sir. Now, in the course of that night, did anything occur to you, should you say, in any way? No, sir. In the morning, did you feel anything different from ordinary? Yes, sir. I felt... Kind of a dull headache as I got up in the morning. Uh, during the night, did anything of any kind attract your attention? No, sir. Not at all. No noise on the part of anyone? No, sir. What time did you get up on the Thursday morning? Quarter past six. You came down the back stairs, of course? Yes, sir. Which are not carpeted. The upper part? The upper part ain't. Uh, that is, from the second to the third story, there is no carpet on it. No, sir. But from the second story to the kitchen entry, there is a carpet on the stairs. Yes, sir. There is from the hall leading from Mr. Borden's to the first story stairs. There is a carpet there leading down to the lower floor. And the only thing on the route up to your room that is uncarpeted is the stairs. Yes, sir. Uh, that lead directly to the attic? Yes, sir. Did you have a timepiece in your room? Yes, sir. I had a clock. What sort of clock was it? One of them little round clocks. Those little round tin or metal ones? Yes, sir. Did you look to see what time it was when you got up that morning or not? I looked when I came down to the kitchen. Is there a clock there? Yes, sir. Do you mean that is the clock you looked at? Yes, sir. What time was it when you came down to the kitchen? Thursday morning. Uh, yes. Quarter past six. Where did you first go after you came down to the kitchen? Down cellar. What did you do down cellar? I brought up some wood, started my fire, and went down to get some coal. And you brought that up in what? The coal hod? The coal hod. Uh, you went down what way to the cellar? Down the back stairs? Not the stairs leading out to the backyard, but the stairs inside the house. Yes, sir. Did you have any occasion to go into or go by the back part of the cellar, the washroom part? No. Or through it? Yes, sir. The door was open there. I went down into the wood room. Which door do you speak of as being open? The door from the washroom into the cellar was wide open all the time. Did you come within observation of the door leading from the washroom out of doors? No, sir. After you had got your wood and coal and started your fire, what is the next thing that you did? I unlocked my door, took in the milk, and put a pan out for the ice man and a pitcher with some water in it. When you came to the door to get your milk, how did you find the locks compared with the condition you left them in the previous night? Just the same way as I left them. After you had unlocked the door, taken in your milk, and put out your pan for the ice, how did you leave the back door then? I hooked the screen door. That is, the panel door was left open, was it? Yes, sir. And so far as you know, was the panel door closed again that day, down to the time and after the time of the deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Borden? The wooden door. Uh, the wooden door. No, sir. When you unlocked the wooden door and left it open, did you do anything to the screen door after you went in? Only hooked it. Now, do you recall doing anything else before anyone came downstairs? No, sir. Except my work around the kitchen generally. Getting the breakfast and I had clothes on the clothes horse. I suppose I took them down. Yes, I generally did. Did you go into any other room before anyone else came downstairs? Dining room. Did you have occasion to go into the sitting room or any other room? No, sir. Just those two rooms? Yes, sir. Upon this morning, what was the condition of the door between the dining room and the sitting room? Open or shut? During the morning, I mean. Shut. I, I do not mean when you first came down, but during the morning, if you know. Well, as far as I remember, it was closed. I don't remember to see it open. The door between the dining room and the sitting room. Between the sitting room and the dining room? Yes. Well, that was always open. And what door did you have in mind when you said it was always closed? The door laden from the kitchen into the sitting room. Who first appeared on the morning of Thursday? Mrs. Barton, I see. The first person. Where did you first see her when she came? I was in the kitchen. 
and she'd come through the back entry, down the stairs from her bedroom. Keep your voice up a little. You are lowering it. She came down the stairs from her bedroom, and I was in the kitchen. Uh, Did she go out of the house at all before breakfast? No, sir. I did not see her. What did she begin to do, or where did she go after she came downstairs? She came downstairs that morning, she told me. Uh, Perhaps what she told you I will not ask you. Where did she go? She went in the sitting room. Now, did you receive any directions about the breakfast from her? Yes, sir. I don't care what they were. Did you notice whether she went into any other room than the sitting room? No, sir. Not that time. Did you begin to make preparations for the breakfast? I mean by way of selecting the food for breakfast before or after you saw Mrs. Borden. After she came down. After she came down and gave directions. Yes, sir. Who next appeared? Mr. Borden. And in what way did he appear? I mean from what stairway? He came down the back stairway from his bedroom. Let me ask you if you've ever known of any communication on the second story between the front and the back part of the house. Is there any way to go that is ever used to your knowledge? There was a door leading from Mr. Borden's room into the front part of the house. And how was that door kept? Couldn't tell you anything about it. You know nothing about it? No, sir. Have you ever known people to go to the front part by way of the back stairs or to the back part by way of the front stairs? Yes, sir. When? Once in a while I used to see the girls, Miss Lizzie and Miss Emma, coming down the back stairs. So they must have gone through, of course, in order to have done that. Yes, sir. Now, what time do you think it was when Mrs. Borden came downstairs? Well, it might be 20 minutes to 7, half past 6. I cannot tell the time, for I never noticed it. How long after Mrs. Borden came down was it before Mr. Borden came down? Well, no more than five minutes, I don't think. What did he do when he came downstairs? He came downstairs... He went into the setting room and put a key on the shelf in the setting room. What key was it he put on the shelf in the sitting room? Gave his bedroom door. Where did he ordinarily keep that? In the setting room. On the shelf? Yes, sir. Did you notice what he did after he brought this key down and put it there? He came out into the kitchen. He put a dressing coat on, as far as I think, and went outdoors. Did he bring anything else downstairs beside his key? Yes, sir. A slot pail. What did he do with that? Took it outdoors. At the time you have just spoken of. After putting his key back. Did you notice him when he went out the screen door? Yes, sir. Did you notice whether at that time the screen door was locked or unlocked? It was unlocked when he was outdoors. Oh, I mean as he went out when he came to the door. It was locked. While he was outdoors, uh, where did you mean? In the kitchen. And the windows of the kitchen look out into the backyard, I believe. Yes, sir. One of them. Uh, Now, perhaps you can tell us what he did when he went out with his slop pail. He emptied it and unlocked the barn and went into the barn. What door of the barn did he unlock? The large door. Leave notes in the yard. You do not mean the front door, the carriage door? No, sir. But the door which is just this side of the privy door? Yes, sir. The door where the water is. The water inside the door. Mr. Moody temporarily suspends the direct examination of the witness. At one o'clock, the court recesses for lunch. The Lizzie Borden Trial, Day 3, featured Mark Penny as Hosea Knowlton, Keith Morrison as William H. Moody, Christine Daniels as George Robinson, Jesse Robb as Abraham G. Hart, Kevin McNeil as John P. Burrell, James Thompson as Everett Cook, Matt Ryan as Jonathan Clegg, Dan Bray as Joseph Shortsleeves, Matt Tufts as James Mather, Jen Tubbert as Bridget Sullivan. This production was produced by Lion's Den Theatre. For more information about Lion's Den, find us at facebook.com slash Lion's Den Theatre, or Twitter at Lion's Den Theatre, or feel free to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm your Day 3 announcer, Allie House. Stay healthy, stay happy, and stay safe.